Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mitchell Giddings Fine Arts. Thank you for choosing to spend your evening here with us. And just by being here, you are supporting the gallery and all of our incredible artists. And before I go too much farther, this is where I usually like to thank the Vermont Arts Council, with whom we share a link and space on the Vermont Arts Council calendar, Brattleboro Community Television, Ames Hill Film and Video Productions, Andy Reichsman and Kate Purdy, who film and edit and make available our artist talks and other special events. Also, we have Deidre Scherer's book for sale next to the desk. <coughs> Tonight we have a chance to explore Deidre Scherer and Jackie Abrams' separate but closely related art forms. Deidre's creations in fabric and thread and more recent woven paper constructions and Jackie's woven paper and wire vessels. By working with the oldest of human crafts, weaving, stitching, and basket making, they each have thoughtfully and purposefully developed a unique and personal and contemporary artistic statement. Amongst our population of talented artists, they stand out for their complete professionalism, originality, their mastery of their chosen craft, the passion with which they follow their ideas, and above all, for the singular beauty of their creations. And not coincidentally, I just had to add this, we received notice that Deidre and Jackie's basket, Couples, which is number 32 on our uh, list of titles, uh, was accepted into the in-print exhibition Excellence in Fibers 4, where it won the award for the Vessels, Forms, and Basketry category, and which will be published in the winter issue of Fiber Art Now. So this is pretty much the end of my introduction. Uh, Jackie and Deidre will both uh, talk uh, with you, but we'll also be sharing an overview of the collaborative process and their work. And there will be plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So we're honored to welcome Deidre Scherer and Jackie Abrams. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't imagine on a night like this, on an afternoon like this, this big crowd. I was like, oh, maybe it'll get canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so really, thank you for getting here. This is amazing. I want to say right off that um, my work is on the walls, and our work is on the pedestals. And I will give a brief description of how um, I've tumbled through these various mediums. I was a painter right off at first. My father, who worked at the Museum of Natural History in New York, did the dioramas, and so he trained me as a painter before I left high school. And I meandered through a lot of mediums. Uh, rug quilting is, I mean, not rug uh, braiding, rug braiding. I did all kinds of things while I was raising my three daughters. And Gianna's here. Yeah. <laughs> and I um, think that's an important part of my history because I never had a moment when I thought I'm going to be an artist. I always was. And that's the beginning and the end of it. I chose fabric maybe because of my father's brilliance in his field. I also chose fabric because it was more conductive to raising children. And so I thank my children for pushing me in these directions. Um, I have one piece on that far wall called Convergence, and you should go over and check it out when we break. And I would like to show how Convergence came about from a drawing I did at Linden Lodge back in um, 1988. And this piece, I did nine drawings of her at least, and I ended up doing nine pieces in the fabric needing to finally realized that I had to 
buy, two, buy one of them back and create another one that had gotten sold. So this is showing you how I drew and then I went to fabric and then to reconfiguring the fabric inside Photoshop. And I had never a background in Photoshop, which was pretty amazing. Uh, just we were the first kids on the block who had computer. So getting them in through the programs and learning them was a pretty major, I'm dyslexic and, you know, the last person on the earth who you'd think would be computer wise. Once I was getting them copied, I was able to do things like the weaving. So here I have, this is going to become the weft. So this is dyslexia coming. And this is the warp. And it's about mm, just over a third done. And I'll leave these up here for you to look at. And I'm leaving these to be looked at closer if you haven't already. I also would love you to be able to, if your hands are clean, just flip them over and look at the backs because the backs tell a lot about what work I've gone through. Um, the fabric is a big thing and I want to jump though right to the weaving because that segues into what we are doing. And the weaving, um, it's a very mundane, almost like fabric, it's a mundane thing to do. We learn it in grade school. I mean, how many people remember weaving something? How early was it? Potholders. <laughs> Thank you. And there are many beautiful examples of it being taken way past that. And we have Marcy Hermansada right here who did a whole series that were a thrill for me to see. Um, they're uh, based on your dad, right? Yeah. And there are ways in which it filters back into my training as a painter who it was mostly impressionist, you know, pointed, pointillism. And that all has thrilled me over the years. There's a lot of atmosphere that is added to whatever you are doing when you weave it together. There's a lot of motion and emotion. And that is also something that no matter how well I've been able to draw or to translate it into fabric or move it into Photoshop and then these weavings, there's a mystery inside of it all that really captures my attention. And as I speak to people, it comes to me that it's also being captured. Thank you. So um, to give you a brief history of my background, I started out as a teacher. Um, and art was not, I was not allowed to take art classes. But when I was 26, I walked into um, a basket maker studio in Chesterfield, Mass. So that was in 1975. Um, and I. Um, fell in love. He did traditional baskets of white ash and I quit teaching um, because my parents couldn't tell me what to do anymore. Uh, and, and I quit teaching and I started doing baskets and for 13 years I pounded trees and collected materials and did functional baskets. In 1990 I decided I really needed to learn about color and the only way to learn about color was to use it. And so I figured out how I could use a heavy cotton paper and paint the paper and weave with the paper using my basket techniques that I know and love. So my joy, my main joy in making vessels is the shaping. I love shaping and making three-dimensional vessels and I weave them, so. So then, how did we get together? There was quite a period of time, maybe five years, that we were aware of each other's work. And 
that's always inspirational, the, being around other working artists and having that exchange going on, studio visits, uh, even critiques. I'd say it's 15 years. 15, thank you. I, to me, it felt like five. No. We're older than that. <laughs> um, and there was a moment when I really was drawn to the idea, do we have that early cupped one? This is me bringing um, to Jackie, is there anything we can do with this? And you have to look a little... It was me taking a woven piece such as this and bending it around and then giving it to Jackie because I couldn't get it much further than, and I knew she could. And so it started us. This is this, our first... This is our first piece. collaborative piece. Um, then we started to seriously think about, and here are these funny little sketches and drawings which you could look at up close afterwards, it, our different viewpoints. And so right from the very creation of them, there was an exchange that was impossible <laughs> Not to, um, it, it's, it's come up like I can feel when I look at them that they couldn't exist without Jackie and they couldn't exist without me. It's scary. I mean, it's like, oh my God, there is a, such a tie-in. Such a, uh, and we feel that when we get together. I mean, our... joy of discovery <laughs> and, and um, the way talking with you is always um, an unbelievable experience, pushing it further. You brought something underway. Yeah, so this is a piece that we're working on now. So um, Deidre hands, we, we figured it out that she, do you have, so this is a mock-up. It's obviously not the full size. The full size is this high twice plus the bottom. So she hands me, she works with my paper, which is a heavy cotton paper, and she prints her images on this heavy paper and then hands it to me, and I cut it and weave it. So this is a work obviously almost done. Um, and this particular one is similar to many of them in the gallery. It's woven with wire. The wire gives it structure and enables me to shape it as I weave. Um, and just to say a word about the couples piece, um, that one was woven with plastic. So it was a different technique. You get a different shape bottom. And there's a clear plastic woven through so that her images are highlighted in the, in the piece as it's woven. I love how Jackie will con continue a conversation with the figurative work and come into, it's like sculpting it, um, way beyond the, what is it, basket making, way beyond, because she really, um, the undulation of the surface is actually this conversation I see. Mm -hmm. So together, I think we create, as Didi said, we create forms that neither of us could do on our own. I mean, I can create forms, and she can create images and, and narrative pictures, but together, putting them together, we have these other forms that we're quite pleased with. Um, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> we're quite pleased with them. <laughs> yeah. If we haven't finished yet, we are still working on it. Uh, there will be a show in March at the Brattleboro Museum, which is quite exciting, uh, that will show a continued effort and adventure. So um, is that enough to get knee deep and, <laughs> and ask for questions? Oh, Jackie, could you explain how, the pla how you use the plastic? So is that in a sheet, and then you cut that? Yeah, so here's one that... Um, so one of the things is that, just to give a little side story about the plastic, is that 
I purchased a sheet of architectural plastic, I think 20 years ago, and somewhere in the back of my head, I remembered that it was in my paper cabinet. I don't know. So I'm weaving the first piece, um, which has the images on, and I'm weaving the first piece, and I'm, so that in basketry technique, the vertical elements are spokes, and the horizontal ones are weavers, and I was weaving the first one and realized that if I used just paper, like I, as the horizontal weavers, on the bottom it would cover the images and I remembered that I had that piece of plastic mm -hmm. sitting in my cabinet. So since then, I have used it for my own work as well because I think, I love that plastic. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a growth from using it the very first time where the plastic lets you see the images, it doesn't obscure them at all. And then you can't form with the plastic, you can't shape, so that's why there's paper at the top and the bottom, paper weavers. Can you hold up a couple's one and turn it around so people can see oh. the complexity? It has a configuration when you turn it and view it um, called parallax, or does anyone have any info on that? Um, it sh uh, shimmers. Interference pattern. Show the Almost. inside of it. Say it again. Maybe it could be called an interference pattern, like an Inter optical effect oh. yeah. as you're looking through it. And when it's simply sitting, it gives this uh, other thing, the shadows and spokes get quite complex. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about creating the strips. Um, sometimes it's called torn and sometimes it's cut. Do you actually tear the strips carefully or do you cut? Yeah, I tear. Um, a good example is the one of um, the life of painters. That is actually my father holding the cat, and it's my stepmom holding the dog. They were both painters. The pieces behind their heads are their works. I went in and, oh God, here's dyslexia again. I tore one and cut the other. Can anyone nearby just see if um, I'm lying or not? <laughs> <You're lying. laughs> it, one, can you tell? Yeah, you, with, with good eyesight. Oh, OK, I'm coming. <laughs> no, I'm coming. I'm over here. OK, me too. I have to take off my glasses. You putting them on. So you can see there, it's cut where it's their work and where it's mine. Um, this is an original fabric piece I did of Sicily. It's in the hall and she's with other people. Whereas my dad's, he was in his own separate space and I, in Photoshop, isolated and then brought them together. And then I found various paintings from Maine where they had the peak of their lives, I, I must say. And um, his work was quite different than hers. That was the porch overlooking the um, harbor, and that's the front of the house, and a tree. I put them, collaged them together. So I did, after the fact, and I would say I could blame Jackie, start cutting. All of these small ones are cut. So it was um, a process of going back and forth with cutting and tearing. And what got you started on taking these images that you had created in fabric and to start cutting them and weaving them? What, how did that process, how did that happen? Good question. I believe that it, came about more in a complex way. Number one, they decided to move here. <laughs> they became a part of my community and they were nearby and whatever stress I was feeling at the time, I was able to do things, because um, weaving is a very meditative, you know, even to the extent that I do it, it's very meditative and soothing. Um, there were other reasons, but that, that was a main one. 
when you first got into doing the paper, it wasn't simply that? Right. I was making um, reproductions, prints at home, and when they were bad and they didn't match color, I tore them up. And then they would lay in a pile and I'd throw them away. And then one day I was waiting for a print and I put them together. You need actually two different prints. So, and that language too is interesting because Jackie um, uses the word spokes, I use the word warp, and then weavers, which go horizontal, is my weft. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. So it was actually destruction of bad prints that got me focused on it. And the, some of those are a riot. I've kept them. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about this piece here with the woman with the blue sweater on? Yeah, that was based on um, self-portraits I have done over the years. Um, a few of them I still have, but I'd, it was really hard for me to do it because it's all about me. And I have portraits in there that go back to... Um, I did them based on, on fabric work that I'd created. And there's one where you can see a little child's head up in the upper right corner. And that was from, from a photograph that I turned into fabric. And then there are others that are really ghosty be over my head when I had, had actually various problems with a pituitary adenoma and I had to go through three surgeries over a course of every seven years. I have survived and done really well, but it was quite something to visit all of those places while I'm creating that piece. It, it ha it's very biological, <laughs> if, if not all of them are, you know. <laughs> Did I get a pretty good answer for that? Uh, I'd like to ask Jackie, have you ever used uh, imagery in your baskets before working with Deidre's um, the scanned yeah. images? I did, but they weren't woven images. They were at the time I was stitching pieces together and to, to create forms and I did photo transfers, and I used the whole image that was adhered and stitched onto the, uh, to the vessel. So yes, not, but not, so yes, but not in this way, and in a different material. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ellen? Where do your shapes come from when you make these things? You, your vessels all have such different shapes. Where do they get my hands? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's, that's what I love to do and I love to practice and that's what I do. Okay. Do, you, do you start out with a concept of what shape it's going to be or does it evolve as you work on it? I guess that's what both. I'm curious about. I guess both is the answer. I mean I have an idea that when I did this one we had already determined by the size of the paper she gave me what size the base would be. And then as I weave it, I try to follow um, the, the shape of the vessel. When we first started, I thought she and Dee, Dee gave me the first hands piece, like there's a hands piece over there. I thought, oh, this isn't going to be as interesting as faces. But in fact, it's more interesting, I think, for me as a weaver to, um, I'm working at one right now at home. And, I mean, I, I love doing the faces, but somehow the hands lend themselves to more shaping. Mm -hmm. Just the yeah. yeah. This one will be tough, Jackie. <laughs> it, this is her schematic, and she's written reaching hands. So she's telling me to pursue a direction and giving me some ideas of putting together two. And this is me struggling with getting just the one, and perhaps there'll be a second one. Um, it might be a totally different shape, but this is the beginning of another, yet another piece. David, could you talk a little bit about 
what I consider one of your most revolutionary and radical uh, choices is to feature older women in your work. Where did, what's the origin of that for you? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, I was a young artist and I had an image of myself not living past 30, 40. And I think I grew up like a lot of us with duck and cover in schools. And that focus robs us of, as a generation, of growing elderly and in place. We are then given instead uh, an image that will explode or will dissipate, you know, in the. Uh, has anyone seen uh, Atomic Cafe? It's a cult movie, and this is unbelievable, but the, one of the directors bought my father and Cicely's house. I know them. Oops. So, so it really is remarkable how coincidence and fitting together things can get. But basically, I didn't see myself as old. And most of us, in fact, die of a full life. We don't die tragically by Mack truck or whatever and flying bodies. But our culture gives us that image all the time. Oh, I'm sorry, Atomic Cafe. It's a great one. It's very revealing. My, my daughters took, it, took me to it on my birthday a number of years ago, and it was like, I saw all of this footage in grade school, and it had been submerged. Um, Deidre, why on, the, on your, the piece right behind Jackie, you changed the color of your background? Uh, they usually appear to be lighter. What uh, did it, how did that come about? Um, at first, I was thinking about women and children and the influence of catastrophe. And the catastrophe got too beautiful. It was mesmerizing. I was using, I had silks, I, I, all kinds of fabulous flame and, you know, dark colors were part of it. So I calmed it down, but it, it represents um, the unthinkable of how does one survive on a roadside or in, inside of um, a catastrophe. And it, I leave it kind of open. Um, sometimes uh, the grandmother isn't really there. In, in fact, she seems more like a guardian angel. And sometimes she really is there. Uh, it goes back and forth for me. Yeah. I don't know how many would read that that way, but I leave it open. Um, most of the time I, you know, let people discover it. I once, um, on the piece next to Convergence, I sold it. And I remember someone came in and said, oh, she's sleeping and she's dreaming. And actually, she's right within minutes of her death. So I sort of stood in front of the piece and let the person go by. And finally, someone walked in and said, oh, my god, you have captured this moment. And she was compelled. And it, it made me feel good because she ended up in the right hands. Uh, I, I like people to recognize what they need to recognize, but it felt important. Yes. Yeah. Oh, if somebody else had a question over there. God, I, I have a question anyway. Um, so um, one of the things that always interests me is the magic that happens at the end of the process or at, it, during the process. And with both of you, I, I kind of feel like you epitomize what I'm trying to express, and that is 
you have figured things out, you figure out how to put your images together, either whether you've torn them apart or put them back together that way, or whether, Deidre, you, in cutting your fabric without lines, are creating the image. But what's happening is something's happening on the surface as Jackie pinches the baskets or as you uh, create forms that are really abstract and then a hole comes out of it. But more has happened because all of the things you were thinking about, all of the things you tried to get out of your mind, uh, have created a brand new narrative. And I think when you talk about somebody seeing a person sleeping and somebody else seeing them uh, just before death, uh, reminds us that we are bringing our experience to what you're doing. And uh, that's one of the things that I hold to be a very dear and important part of, of the artwork. And I'm just, uh, I said it uh, as I introduced you, uh, we're honored to have you here. But uh, that's the reason, just as an artist, um, that is very important to me. And I think everybody here is in for a real treat as, as you really investigate and look at this work. Thank you. And it really is a fine point because no matter how much we draw and how much we cut or shape, there's a magic inside of that process. And I literally cannot say how it happens. But if you set yourself there, <clears throat> and if you are there long enough and you put in the time and the effort, it's likely to poke up. It's likely to come through. And that's what I think is exciting to me as I work, exciting to us as we work. Mm -hmm. Would you? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I'm curious about your lineage, both of your lineages, um, your background with moving into your particular art form, and who has affected you, your lineage. So can you say a little bit about that, both of you? Like our mentors, do you mean? <coughs> what has affected you, mentors? People you've worked with, a teacher that really stood out, just people that helped you, members, affected you. you. Um, so I've had, um, I've had many very excellent technique, technical teachers along all these, this is 40 something years, I don't know how many 40 something. I've had many technical teachers that have helped me with the skills that I have. Um, conceptually though, because my baskets are no longer about techniques, they include techniques, but they're not about techniques. I think the most the thing that made the most difference for me was I've done a fair amount of craft development work in Africa, um, working with women and my experiences with those women and how those women affected my life from the very first time, very first day I was there and how many trips back and forth I've taken, um, made me do what I did. A, and this is what, why part, partially why Deidre and I became together, I started doing these pieces that I called women forms and I've been working on them for a long time and it's about how our experiences shape us. And the women that I worked with in Africa had nothing. They, they had nothing, they lived in these little shacks and, um, but they had this joy in life and, I'm, and I try, I try to live my life like that as best I can here with a whole house full of stuff. Um, and and I, in the work I make, I try to express that. Um, I would say one of my biggest influences was my father. Um, also my um, awareness of certain works and Kathy Cole, it stands out really strongly. Um, Paula Motorson Decker, but Kathy Colwitz I come back to a lot because she worked with the, the roughest materials. Uh, if you're not aware of her, look her up and you know find, find your way. I'll, I'll give you the spelling, whatever you need. Colwitz with a K. Okay, and she, she definitely, I mean artists all through the years, Rembrandt would do someone on the deathbed. But so few people would just take a hold of what is 
um, not nice art, you know. And even in the early part of my career, it was often asked, first thing, why are you doing elders? You know, in a negative, not a positive way. Somewhat the culture has changed. We are aging. Uh, we have, have a major, um, and, and there's more availability of hospice and other things that support us. The hospice locally supported me going out and doing the work that became, um, this I had already done the last year was finished, but surrounded by family and friends, which I have a catalog of, was primarily the local hospice connecting me and I went throughout New England looking for people to, to be connected with. Um, many influences. Uh, there, I, I often sit at my table and I think, who else is with me? Um, Deirdre, uh, you have a, a beautiful written artist statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the paragraph where you're talking about drawing directly with scissors, and um, and using the stitches to uh, as your as your brush strokes, I thought that was such a beautiful way to discuss how you do it. And I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about that, if you could, and tell us a little bit more about how you think about using. How do you create with fabric and color and stitches? Thank you, especially because all artists have hell to write a few paragraphs about their work. <laughs> that feels wonderful. Um, I dared to use the analogy to paint and to brushes and brushwork, but um, very early on I was also told I was betraying the medium because I didn't stay uh, on the surface. I went into figurative. And I think uh, it really kicked off a whole movement because I didn't see a lot of people working that way. I don't project, I don't do anything but eyeball the drawing that I'm working from, such as in this case, and layer and cut and layer and cut and use the machine as another drawing tool. So the scissors are a drawing tool. And it's an odd way to draw because usually marks are made like directly or pushed. And the scissors are more direct, but the machine is like it's in the middle of this motion to do whatever you're lining or creating. I've recently been reading um, some review that said I betray the medium and he meant it positive. <laughs> I've, I've been told, you know, many different angles of it, so it's, it's a thrill to get to that point that I'm not, it could be done in stone or it could be done in something else, but thank you. So, so I have a question for you um, about your baskets and how using those image, Deidre's images has changed your basketry? Um, well, or, ha or has it, or how so has it, it has, So I've started using the plastic, as I mentioned before. Um, but it, it, so when you're making one of those baskets, um, is it somehow different for you using her images than, as if you, than if you were just making one of your baskets otherwise? Yes, it's different because when I do these kind of forms, which is the same technique, I'm, I'm focused on the shape, but I'm also focused on the surfaces that I know I will create afterwards because usually I don't, ha I don't have images on it. So when I'm doing this, the images are the final product, or the images are what it's about, and so I have to interact with the images in a way that I don't necessarily interact when I'm weaving my own work that I know I'm going to cover and, and create something else on the surface. So it's a, different, it's a different way of thinking and interacting with the form as I weave it. Mm -hmm. Has it affected the, the shape of the vessels at all? The form, her images, yes, definitely affect the shape of the vessel. Yes, definitely. So just 
To me, an example of that would be this one that has the top that goes up mm -hmm. just as the heads are um, ascending upwards. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it fits, the yeah. shape fits right. that. So I try to respond to her images, and we talk about it in advance what images we're going to put on there and how we're going to work on it. I mean, each one of these represents a lot of hours of talking. Um, and, um, you know, meeting and talking and evaluating and, um, and, and so that one has paint on it, so that one has paint on it, and there's one, the inside of the clasped pans one has paint on it, and um, sometimes it's we're dealing with a mistake, so like that when that was done by a professional printer and the inside of the, of the paper was messed up. So we thought, well, how do we deal with this? We Deidre painted it so that it became something else. So did that answer your question, or did I go off on a tangent? Yes. <laughs> Steve. Oh, I just quickly wanted to say that Deidre's always been misclassified, reclassified, unclassified because of the imagery and the technique she uses. But I remember one review she had where the reviewer was sort of taken with the images, but he couldn't deal with the fact that it was in fabric. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the review, he said, but you have to see it to be believed. <laughs> so. Baltimore Museum of Art, Baltimore Sun. I'll never forget him, and I took out just, you have to see it to believe it. <laughs> but I think I want to go back and show the whole thing now. You know, you excerpt. <laughs> Would it have been possible to make the baskets in the same technique of, of warped, and, warped and weave that, that Deirdre works with without the wire, or is the wire crucial? So that's what this one is, this couple's one. Okay. It's the warp and the weft, mm -hmm. and, and so the, some of the warp threads, weavers and basketry, are the plastic. So it is without the wire, and that's shaped differently. It's a, it's a different technique, actually. Would you yeah. have been able to do it in paper without a paper mache or some other kind of no. thing to help? No, it would, be, it would be another whole technique to figure that out, how to do it. It would be more difficult because the, the, one of them weaves around, so to match, it's hard enough to match up the vertical pieces, and to try to match up the horizontal pieces with it would be really fussy and probably not fun. I think it would shatter. I mean, if we get into that, we'll let you know. <laughs> well, it's I, I, one kind of contrasting element between the, you know, the vessels themselves and Deirdre's other work. Right. And it disrupts the image in a different way. You know, it changes the image mm -hmm. in a different way with the wire versus right. the... Right. Yeah. right. And that's some of the reason that the plastic was used in that piece over there, it disrupts the image less. And then, of course, the choice of the color wire changes everything also. Yeah. This is kind of, or actually quite relevant, having to do with the collaborative um, works that you've done. Um, Josh is here, and you did some amazing collaborative work with a glass blower. And no, there's not an example here, but it's more um, having to do with, you really like to adventure. And to collaborate. I and I just this have so much respect time. for that, huh? Yeah, this is my fourth time yeah. collaborating with other artists. It, it stretches me. It makes me... It's so great. Yeah, makes me... I like experimenting and failing when you're... If you experiment, failing is as important. You learn as much from failing, even if it's ugly, and then you have permission to sort of wreck it and learn and keep moving on. It meant a lot to me to have the wisdom of someone who has done collaboration because um, I've, I've been a little less familiar. So it really did help to have your clarity about that. We, I mean, brought different things to it, but hers was very much a, a homing in. Thank you. Georgie. I was surprised how much one sheet of paper cost when you were making the baskets and that maybe when you revealed that cost, people in the audience will understand why you correct 
the mistakes because <laughs> I was stunned. Do you want to tell them how much one sheet? <laughs> it, it's, it's that and the printing. Yeah, the printing. Yeah. The printing, um, two sided. And it's, um, I, I must give credit to Lotus. I have done some on my own um, Epson printer at home, but my, my machine will only take 17 inches wide and a certain length. They're bigger, and they have been wonderful. I have one more, maybe five more, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm really curious, I'm always curious, and I get myself in a lot of trouble when I ask this question, about your work ethic, your, um, your discipline, what your, what your process is like, getting up early, going to bed. I mean, do you work for two hours, ten hours, three weeks? There you go. <laughs> Very different answers here. Right? <laughs> we work around the clock because I start at 12 midnight more or less and go till about 7 o'clock in the morning. And so I'm a night owl. I've been like that all my life. Um, it's easiest because it's less disrupted by phone calls. There are certain ones I expect, but nobody calls yet that hour. Except for Hildegard. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter. The two of them are sitting right there. It started when yeah. all the children went to sleep. Yes, it started when my children went to sleep. No, it, it actually was earlier. I was prone like that from high school, I can remember. Yeah. Um, and then the work ethic is, uh, even if you don't feel like it, put yourself there. Because it will never come out of anywhere if you don't put yourself in the space. Literally, I'm in my studio. And if you don't feel like it, go anyway. Um, and it will catch up with you. You know, things will start. It's, I mean, the w best part is when it's cooking mm -hmm. and you can't wait to get in there. But that doesn't always happen. The muse is not always going to be waiting for you and happy to see you. You got to go in and just be there, push. So I'm a morning person. <laughs> I get up and I'm working. Sometimes we communicate by email between 6 and 7 in the morning because she's still up and I'm up in Adam. And so I, and I usually, I hardly ever work in the evening, hardly, hardly ever. Um, my mind doesn't function. I'm collapsed by the end of the day. Um, some people might say I was obsessed. Um, I'm in my studio more than any other room. I live in my studio. My cat lives in my studio. Where, where, there, um, I'm making things. But the other side of being an artist, which really is not good, is all the paperwork and the ordering and the computer time. And anyone would knows about that. That just, um, it's a terrible part of what we do. It's not a creative. It's not creative. It's it's computer and it's paperwork and it's and every and you have to do that if you run a business and you're trying to sell work you have to do that I personally tried to get that over with early in the morning um, which is why I'm emailing at six in the morning and then try to finish it and then not go back to it for the rest of the day and so I have a big sheet of plywood which is my one of my work tables and one side is my office and the other side is my desk and I leave the office and go to my leave the office and go to my studio, whatever. The other side of the plywood, and I try not to go back and forth between the two. And then, and then every free moment, what, what would I rather do? Either out in the garden or making something. Any more questions? Peeves. <laughs> no. Um, so I'm curious about. Obviously, the collaborative piece has had a huge impact on you guys, um, collectively and separately. Um, 
Where do you see your challenges moving forward? Um, more collaborative work? Um, I know the museum show is coming up, and that's a really wonderful opportunity and challenge. But do you, can you explain anything that is coming in the pipeline that, is, that you can share? I think that um, for the museum, we need 12 new pieces, which is a, a substantial amount of pieces, because these pieces are here, so we need 12 others. Um, I think you know we're developing them. We have almost six done. Um, and we're developing them, and I don't think we know. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's wide open. It's wide open. We don't really know what we don't know. And there might be accidents and you know needs yeah. to play off some ideas and let them go. Um, the one that Jackie's working on right now, uh, I had put sheen collet over the entire surface, and she cut. Um, through the sheen collet, the, the layers. Mm -hmm. So it has this ghosty look. I'm thrilled by, you know, how it is holding up, right? And mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem to be shredding or, uh, because she really has to manipulate it. Mm -hmm. So if I give her a paint that's going to rub off, or if I give her sheen collet that's not glued properly, it would be a disaster. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe it would look, uh, you know, it, it's like you, you just play with it and run with it. Um, I often think that I should go back to paint. It's strong. <laughs> it's not the first time it was dropped. <laughs> or the cat. <laughs> or the cat. Not the... I think of going back to paint which is where I started, um, but that's yet to be seen. I've done a few, very few, not ready to show. This is it, going once, going <laughs> twice. Oh, I have one more. Oh. <laughs> did, did you, um, Deidre, did you ever do landscapes? Or yes. In you did? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, before um, finding the elders, I was meandering through a lot of subject areas. And I did um, really, I would say, very conservative landscapes. Uh, one important one was a, a red building over in Keene, a nice old building that I did in trade for teeth. I was, <laughs> I had a wonderful uh, periodontist who traded for a lot of work. And I did birds for a while. I had one bird that came up actually fairly recently. Someone asked me, could you do a bird? Um, it has to be a, a hummingbird. And it had a whole story about um, this husband who died and told his wife, I'm coming back to visit you as a hummingbird, so watch out for me. I said, no, I don't do birds anymore. So I'm taking my compost out to the garden, and I hear this And I turned around slowly, and there's this hummingbird right this many inches away from the back of my head. And I said, OK. And I did, I did, I did this hummingbird for this commission. And um, I'm thrilled that I did it. They were thrilled, but it's sort of like I better do it. <laughs> is, is illustration a big part of your work now? Illustration. Illustration for books? Um, I've done an abstract book. That was a collaboration, but I, um, it wasn't as, it, it was a different type. She lives on the West Coast, and the book isn't ready yet, so I, I wasn't even going to talk about it. But um, I haven't done illustration. I get chosen. Uh, you've seen covers that I've been on and things like that occur. But I actually don't go after them. They go, come after me. Yeah. I'm looking around one last time. <laughs> I just want to thank Dee Dee and um, Jackie once again. And thank the audience, because you're a great audience as usual, and uh, 
Thank you all for being here tonight. Mm -hmm.